speak about uh, Rotata Cloud Prepare and uh, let's see a little bit uh, how this works. And first of all, I want to uh, say thank you for the preparation of this uh, uh, webinar that we made and uh, Usama who organized this and Saeed who kindly uh, accepted to uh, uh, participate, to co-participate with me to this one. Thank you very much. Um, so now just a little look to Annecy. This is the view uh, from Annecy, the lake of Annecy, and she is close to Geneva. It's a uh, uh, east part of France for people who don't know. And here, if you look at this little circle here, what you can see is my hospital. It's a very old hospital. It started from the very beginning. It was uh, just uh, two operating room and, and two office and uh, with a waiting room and you can see now it was uh, rebuilt all around and uh, there's a lot of things all around that we can uh, uh, arrange now and, and this is the private hospital. Uh, these are my uh, <clears throat> disclosures that you can find on the website of the AAOS, uh, find easily here. And uh, now we go to uh, the topic. We, we have today discussion about Rotatacoff and we can see here the uh, posture super rotatacuff and the subscap. The main issue uh, by understanding rotatacuff there is to really separate subscap with anterior entity totally different to the posture super entity. Taking into account that subscap is pulling the shoulder posteriorly because the scapula is posterior to the thorax. And this is very, very important to understand. The normal cuff is here and we used to say the anterior cuff is something which is at the anterior side of the shoulder. Wrong. The anterior side of the shoulder is posterior to the thorax and the scapula is posterior to the thorax. So what happened is that if you have like now an anterior calf tear and then you will have an anterior superior migration of the human head because this muscle is not pulled back posteriorly anymore. Uh, Usama, I don't know about you, but I can hear some uh, noise on the background. Maybe somebody did not disconnect the microphone or there's some noise, I don't know. Okay. I'll, this, I'll is the, this is the posterior uh, cuff tear, which is different. The migration is posterior. And this is the massive cuff tear, where the migration in case of contraction of the deltoid will be an upper migration of the human head and there is nothing that will center the human head anymore. So that's, that's the problem of the rotator cuff. The duty of the subscap is to stabilize the shoulder. And it's a very big muscle. It has two parts. Uh, mostly, it's a, we know it's close to seven parts, but uh, the two third upper tendon are different to the third inferior, which is more muscle and a capsule, which is very thick capsule, but very thin muscle attachment here. Uh, what is important to understand is that the muscle, uh, the tendon, uh, if you look at the really intra-articular arthroscopic view, looking from posture, it's very difficult to assess the entire subscap. And if you only look at the uh, intra-articular subscap, what you can see is the upper third of the subscap because all the lower two-third of the subscap are covered by a capsule, which makes that the subscap prepare was much later managed arthroscopically than the posterior superior rotator cuff. So now if we go to, uh, to the intra-articular view, this is what we can see. And here you see it's an intra-articular with air. It's a very old video, but what you see is that subscap is part of the anterior stabilization of the biceps. And there is a relationship between the biceps and the subscap attachment, which is very high. And this is linked to the proximity. But let me tell you that in a few cases, we can have a subscap there with no biceps instability, which is extremely rare. But what I'm saying here is that the entity of the stabilization of the biceps is really linked to the ligament, superior glenohumeral ligament and <clears throat> the coracohumeral ligament anteriorly. Posteriorly, the biceps is uh, close to the supraspinatus and stable. What you can see here is that the subscap is even crossing the medioglenohumeral ligament. And this cross 
means that when you have a retraction of the subs cap after a tear, and then it gets stuck to the ligament, and it's a very important to release the subs cap from the ligament when you want to repair the subs cap and bring it back to its normal position. And at least what you can see is that there is a very thin capsule at the upper part of the subs cap, which is the rotator interval and this rotator interval is something which you can open and access to communicate from the inside to the outside of the shoulder. What is very specific to the subs cap too is the nerve, the, the vascularization and the innervation of the subs cap is totally different to the supra and infraspinatus. Supra and infraspinatus are suprascapular nerve. Subs cap are branches coming directly from the plexus which is different to what the subcap is. And this is a dissection that I made, suppose, arthroscopically to show the innervation of the subcap and to show you how weak are the nerves of the subcap. And you can understand that if you manage, for example, a release, extraticular release, and you push the release under the coracoid with your scissors, when you manage to do a shoulder arthroplasty and you cut all these nerves, you will have a fatty degeneration of your muscle. And you see how much these nerves are weak and small and going toward the muscle directly. This is the axillary nerve you can see here and the plexus on the front. This is the conjunct tendon and it's a right shoulder here. And here where you see the plexus there, you can do this dissection and you can even see the artery which is right there. So, that dissection shows the anatomy of the subscap, which is tremendously important to understand. But what you should notice is even the distance. The distance of the upper subscap here is very far from the plexus. So when you repair the upper subscap, you don't have to dissect the plexus. You only have to dissect the plexus when you have a massive subscap there. And this is linked to the stability of the biceps. And here you perfectly see that you have a biceps instability, which is linked to a detachment of the deep layer of the subscap. Today, um, we have made a classification, as you kindly remind, that this is uh, not linked to the biceps. And the biceps itself, it's a very important to understand that the biceps is the first one that will show you that the subscap may be torn behind the ligament. And this is really something new. What do, what do I mean? If you have an anterior biceps erosion, it means that when you have an integrity of the ligament, which is the superior glenohumeral ligament, you may think that the subscap is intact because the tear is eaten by the integrity of the ligament. And this is important that we underlaid this a few, a few years ago. And what you can see here, for example, is it looks to be, this is another shoulder, so the other side, it looks to be an intact subscap. But you have a sentinel sign, which is an erosion of the biceps. And if you cut the super glenohumeral ligament, what you will discover is here, the subscap tear behind the ligament. You see the subscap is torn, and you see that this has led to an instability, partial instability of the bicep, which leads to an erosion of the anterior biceps, which is tremendously important. Now, what about a classification? Classification is very easy, but it, it, uh, it's only about the uh, total layers of the subscap. And we are working currently on uh, making a, a better classification, an improvement of the classification with partial tear of subscap. 1A, 1B, uh, 2A, 2B, 3A, 3B, 4A, and, and, and 4B. And this is uh, type 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, where you can see that the subscap is uh, torn, more or less. But what you can see is that the head is still centered. In type 5, that we will not consider today because it's not about the subcap there, the center of the humeral head is not here anymore, and there is an anterior superior escape, which leads to a coracoid impeachment. So what is it, 
why is it important to use this classification? Because if you have the upper third of the subscap, which is type one and two, and then you can repair it from inside the joint. And we will say, as soon as you start to have, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to have a bigger subscap there, larger subscap there like a three, and then you may move from inside the joint to outside the joint. And at least if you have a massive, and then you must be extra articular to release the plexus and, and to, to bring the tendon back to its normal place. So let's have a look first to, to this one, with the subscap there at the upper foot. This is certainly one of the most common. I must say that now I'm really paying attention not to over repair this subscap there. It's important to uh, notice where the, and to, to see where the deep layer is and to bring the deep layer back here. Very often this patient you operate on are stiff post-op and they have pain. And it's important to keep the rotator interval open post-op. But you see that here we can repair the tendon without trying to repair the capsule uh, or we can bring the capsule and the tendon back to uh, his own place. It's very important not to over tight this. And here you see that we just bring the tendon back to his lesser tuberosity with two anchors. This is an old video with two metallic anchors. And we bring back here the tendon and we should avoid to over tight this because otherwise the patient will be very stiff and painful post-op. And it's even important to cut the biceps in these cases because otherwise the biceps will be squeezed and will be responsible of the pain post-op. This is the kind of transition. How do we go uh, from the subacromal space to the subcoracoid space? And this is exactly what I am showing here. We're on a subacromal space, and this is the anatomy. There is a fascia that separate the subacromal space to the subcoracoid space. And this is where you can find and follow the coracohumeral ligament, and this is where you can open the rotator interval. When you do this, there is a communication between the intraarticular subacromal space and subcoracoid space. The subcoracoid space is here limited by the tendon and you can even go outside the subcoracoid space, open the fascia to go to the sub pectoralis space. And here you open and you make a communication between every space. And here you can enter and try to uh, repair and insert your anchors. So, when is it mandatory to expose the nerve? This is a slide, a very old slide, even Flato many years ago at Val d'Isère, maybe 20 years ago, when he showed uh, the release uh, that I am doing now uh, from the nerve, and everybody is scared for the nerve. But when do we have to go to the nerve and to release? That case is a typical case where you have to release. You have to release because you see that if you want to bring the subscap back, you can't because the subscap is stuck to the medioglenohumeral ligament and is stuck to the carcoid process and is stuck to the conjunct tendon. This fascia is the fascia of the subcoracoid space. And if you look at this fascia, as long as you don't open this fascia, there is no danger for the plexus. As soon as you open the fascia, and then it's like you, you bring a, a curtain and you open a curtain and then you will see the plexus, it's just behind. It's a different room, it's a different space. It's just a way to communicate. And it's very important in the shoulder now to know from which room you are treating which tendon because a tendon is like a wall in the house of the shoulder. It's not the house with only one room. It's the house with several rooms we are communicating and you need to open windows between the room in order to uh, restore the wall. And this is where we can restore the wall. And you see, we have an access from the subcoracoid space, sub burst, sub uh, acromal space and intra-articular space. 
This is another example. Uh, left shoulder, you can see here, this is a live surgery. Uh, left shoulder, you can see that here we have a very thick uh, anterior super rotator cuff tear with an instability of the biceps. Look at the frames that we uh, see on these biceps here. And look at the adhesion of the subscap here. Between the subscap and the carcoid process and the subscap uh, and, and the conjunct tendon. And look at this adhesion that we have here at the anterior shoulder on a subcarcoid space. So this is one of the most tricky surgery that I know where you need to release knowing that at some point you will see the plexus and it's very hard to find the plexus without damaging the plexus. But if you try to bring the, the tendon back to his anatomic location, you see that here you can't do it because the release is not good enough. So I had to increase my release and I had to do more release here toward the plexus in order to be sure that I will be able to bring the muscle and not only the tendon back to his anatomic position without pulling on the plexus. Means that I will not damage the nerve by pulling the tendon back here. So you need to release this. I'm initially a hand surgeon. I've been doing more than 1,000 plexus surgery open before I started to do atroscopic surgery. So the nerve for me is not, is not a problem. It's, it's, like, uh, it's, it's like my friend. I, I never damage the nerve by doing this uh, nerve release. Uh, this is another and last example that I want to show. Am I on time, Sama? Is that okay? Okay. You find your time. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So this is another left shoulder, another example here, which is very similar to the previous one. It's just to show you that it's not so different uh, uh, cases. It's, uh, we have many different cases where very similar is when you have a massive retracted subscap here with a terrible pain, which you can see here that the patient, you know, they have pain on the hand, they have pain on the fingers, they have pain everywhere, and they really complain about this numbness here. So this is the anatomy, this is the conjunct tendon, this is the subscap, and you see here that the space is very narrow, and when you pull on the subscap, you can do it. This is a very important trick is to start the dissection of the subscap. This is why I wanted to keep this video different to the previous one. Is that you need to find the carcoid process. The carcoid process is like my index finger. If you start from there, you will find the upper border of the subscap. And you will find this anterior ligament, which is a very important one, carcoidal ligament. You release the carcoidal ligament and you keep the link between subscap and supraspinatus, which is a very important link. And you must keep that link every time in order to bring the tendon back to its place and, and to have a very secure fixation. Once you do that, you put the traction suture on it. And then you pull and you manage to do your dissection again. So I do it with a vapor. I release the, still the same aponevrosis that you know, and you go from the inferior side of the subscap where you feel the axillary nerve to the upper border of the subscap that you hear. And progressively, you do your dissection as you can see here. Progressively, you do your dissection and you will find the plexus there. The first nerve, the most posterior nerve you will find will be the axillary nerve. In the front of it, you will see the artery and you will see the radial nerve. It's very hard to see the musculocutaneous nerve from that side because the musculocutaneous nerve is anterior to the shoulder. But here you see all the adhesions and you see that the upper part of the soft cap, there is no risk because the plexus is very medial here. It's difficult and more tricky, more inferiorly. But by chance, what you can see here is that you will see that the, the adhesion is easier to dissect as far as you go close to the plexus. And here you have your total dissection, and here you bring your uh, 
uh, probe very inferiorly, you respect the fibers of nerves who are going toward the muscle. And here you are going inferiorly in order to repair this uh, uh, subscap without pulling the plexus together with the subscap. I'm showing here cases which are not the most common cases of the subscap, but this is where, uh, you know, sometimes you have to be because the subscap retraction are leading for young people, very often traumatic cases, are leading to very high symptoms. And it's important to uh, release everything in order to repair. And now once the release will be over, you will go back to here. I will go a little more for the video. And then you will see that here, this is at the end of the surgery, where you will see that we have passed every suture and we, we bring every suture back to here and we manage to make a double row repair of the subs cap together with the supraspinatus down to here. And we do the double row repair and you see that this is a watertight uh, shoulder, but we keep the rotata interval open, it's very important. This is the patient, you see it's not an old guy, he's a young guy, he's about 42 years old, and he had a massive tear, he's a laborer, he's working hard, and you see he has big muscles. He's three months post-op. You may say, oh, he's a little stiff. I don't care. For me, the stiffer the patient is at three months post-op, the stronger he will be at two years post-op. And I don't care about stiff net for subscap because finally they will go to a very good result if you respect the healing process. And this guy is here, you see three months post-op, able to resist to the push of my fellow. What about post-care? Uh, no retropulsion. It's very important to understand, and I don't know if you have a vision to my video, but here it's very important that the subscap here is not going like this. And, and this is tremendously important that you don't let the, sub, the, the, the elbow going back to here and that you keep the elbow on the front because what is the worst scenario is that you keep the internal rotation but you bring the elbow back to the thorax and this is what pulls the most in, in, the, in the, the subs cap. Um, as I told you, we do immobilization for six weeks, internal rotation in case we have a majority of subs cap tear rather than posterior superior tear and no physiotherapy for, for close to three months, six weeks or three months. I let the patient do what they want to do and I don't want them to go to physiotherapy before three months. After three months, the tendon is ill or not, retorn, but at least they can do whatever they want. So uh, we publish things and, and you know, this is not very interesting because you can see the publication here and you know that we have good results, but what we can know is that we have a lot of type three and four in a massive uh, subscap there and we published that we had uh, a very good result despite the fact that we had a big subscap there in this patient that we, we show. And uh, we, we have uh, here uh, a very interesting thing and, and to show that the biceps were pathologic in 93% of the cases, which is normal. And these, these are the results. Uh, we made a few pec minor transfer and I didn't show you here the video, which is not the most important thing, but what you can see is that if you achieve to do a good subscap repair, you will have good results, most of the cases. The rare repair rate is not that big and uh, it's related to age, fatty infiltration, and the dimension of the subscap there, and the post-op. If the patient does not respect the immobilization and go back to activity before three months, it will for sure go have to have a recurrence of calf care. So uh, it's important to see that uh, uh, there is no influence uh, mostly on that very significantly, but there is an influence of the fatty infiltration because we don't have type five on this. So the conclusion is that we have good, excellent outcome, uh, low repair, excellent return of strength and no external rotation deficit if you release the plexus correctly. And if it's irreparable, and then we can talk about it, but this is another topic about how to manage an irreparable subs cap there for young, middle young and old people. Old people is easy, 
reverse. Middle young is difficult. Young is more than difficult, but tendon transfer mostly, latissimus dorsi transfer, or pec minor or pec major transfer can be discussed for these patients. So uh, there is no need for plexus release in this repair in type one and type two, and most of the time for type three. Plexus release is mandatory for type three and four, for when you have adhesion in inflammation in order to avoid nerve complication and to increase the power story. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, as we said here, uh, uh, thank you for this. Uh, I think the best thing is to go over uh, these cases as uh, Laurent did. So, but the most important when we deal with the massive tears, you know, it's a big tear. It's uh, more than one tendon, uh, more than five centimeter. It's a difficult one. So when you deal with them, you have to understand that these are uh, less predict uh, predictable and usually associated with higher rate there. So meticulous uh, attention to these cases to minimize uh, the failure rate and to improve the success uh, to do with the many factors like increase of fatty uh, filtration. You have to review the MRI. You have to, uh, to see whether the patient is smoking. You need to get the size of the tear and the complexity of the tear. And uh, the tricks here, you have to make sure that you have a very capsular release uh, because that sometimes can prevent you from reducing uh, the tendon back to its place. You have to see that you're taking the full thickness because sometimes you can get fooled by having only the superficial layer. Uh, sometimes you need to medialize the uh, medial uh, uh, anchors to uh, shorten the distance for the cuff to repair. Uh, tricks like marginal convergence for the longitudinal split and other augment like a, uh, the biceps patch and augmentation with the tissue. So if we're going to look at this patient, uh, which uh, we will see here, uh, this gentleman is uh, 55 years old. He, this is intra, uh, uh, in the joint, in the green human joint. You can see that there is a V-shaped tear but even the deep layer is two layer, one there uh, and uh, the superficial layer. So when you want to repair, you have to address this. Then you have to see it's like a more of a, a, a crescent shape. You have to see if it's reducible or not. Because if you try to repair and the tension, it will not come. You can see now it's a slip back. So you need to do the release from uh, around the tendon. You have to go on the top of the tendon and release it adequately. And as well as you have to go between uh, underneath the tendon and take especially the capsule or the scar tissue that formed uh, between the severe glenoid or the labrum and the, the, and the cuff itself. So we have adequate release here to start with. So we can see it is coming more. Now we go with the shaver underneath and the tip of the labrum and the biceps to release that uh, scar tissue that form from uh, the tear itself as well as from the capsule the inside. And once you get enough release, you can, you can usually mobilize this tendon properly. I usually prepare the foot criteria uh, to uh, shave it so we can get a uh, good bleeding. Uh, we put first anchor. Uh, we use the, we get, if you look here, this is the double thickness, the foot thickness of the cuff, the superficial and the deeper layer. So we have to go through that. I'm using the tension suture to bring the, uh, the, the cuff to me so I can handle it and I can pass uh, the, the suture through the cuff. This is the anterior medial anchor. And here I switch to the uh, glenohumeral humeral scope from inside just to make sure that I don't take the biceps tendon with me when I try to repair and I have to take the full thickness here. I usually use uh, a lasso, uh, suture lasso to bust the suture exactly what I want. And after we bust, we tie it medially and this is uh, uh, the lateral uh, anchor here uh, uh, 
it's just routine, routine. And you can see here, we did this cuff repair uh, in full. And uh, uh, this is, we, we did this gentleman in November. And uh, and this is him now, five and a half months after the repair. And you can see almost full range of motion for that massive tear. And he's uh, extremely happy uh, with his range of motion. So although the massive tear can be difficult to address, but if you meticulously address them properly, you can, you can get them where uh, you want and where the patient wants. Uh, so we'll go to the next. So this is another lady. Uh, she's a 73 years old, six months of bilateral shoulder uh, pain. On the right side, she has almost done fatty degeneration. She needs a reverse, uh, uh, but on the left side, it's, uh, it was relatively newer when she present. So uh, we discussed with the patient uh, that we will tackle the new one. At least we can repair it, and we will we can do the reverse anytime later for the right side. And we did uh, actually. A couple of weeks prior to to Corona lockdown, so I'm following with her. So uh, we when we talk about marginal complaints, it's a, it's a trick that we can use in our armamentarium, especially if you have an longitudinal tear that uh, require approximation to get a proper repair. Uh, it's not it's difficult uh, and different than the previous one with the uh, C-shaped tear. So this is this is the lady. Uh, we had this there, which uh, I'm preparing the footprint here. Um, we, you know, with the woman, there's osteoporotic, so I try to be gentle with the uh, cortication of the footprint area. Uh, this is, we're looking from the subacromial space. Uh, this is the tear, you can see, uh, it's a split. It's, it's uh, tight, we cannot uh, uh, bring it to where we want. So we went with the first anchor. And again, uh, we can see this from inside, I'm looking at it, just making the two anchors in the medial and can see that it's a longitudinal split of the cup. So here I went back to the linear humeral scope. I usually like to switch in and out, especially for the anterior part of the, uh, the cuff. I want to make sure that I have, I'm not catching my biceps and then I have a good thickness of the, of the, of the cuff. And here I'm just doing, releasing the scars between the severe labrum, the glenoid and the cuff to make sure that I can mobilize this cuff uh, when I repair it properly. Then I use, again, as I said, I use a lasso for my passage. I passed the suture for both anterior and posterior. Then I went after I finished the two uh, suture passed through both anterior and posterior. Then I insert my marginal convergence suture using, again, lasso. I pass it this, uh, front, then I go from the back. And then it's a suture management. You have to know where you put your suture and how you balance. And you can see down there the loop of the orthocord. And then I repair them. I tie the suture here. In a second. Usually this trick can bring the tendon uh, where you want it. And you can help you with the major repair uh, and uh, uh, it's a nice trick to repair the longitudinal split. So after we put that one, we I insert two more, one uh, anterior uh, suture, 
this one for the uh, uh, interior part of the cuff. And I thought, uh, I didn't like the look uh, in the back like a dog hair, so I, I put one to close it and to push it inside. Then I used the, the suture part from the, the anchor and I suit and tie them both together like a double poly uh, uh, repair. Uh, we'll see, we, I tie them together and then, and uh, this is the knot. Then I get the two other parts and I tie them in the front. to uh, then I take the the tape uh, that's in both anchor and uh, fix the lateral row uh, with uh, a knotless anchor uh, you will see now with the with the old ladies I always worried about their bone quality. That's what the posterior uh, lateral row, and this is the anterior uh, lateral row. I use something like spiffle lock here. And you will see now the the repair. I usually switch my camera to the front uh, uh, interior uh, interior uh, portal to look at the uh, repair itself fully and make sure that the construct is what I want and there's nothing missing before we close. And with this way, we have a very good repair. She's now uh, this lady. Peculiar. Uh, she's now two months uh, since her. So that's for the severe uh, uh, severe uh, repair. And uh, uh, I was talking yesterday to. Uh, Laurent, and this is a very interesting case. This guy is a 40 years old male uh, who fell from stairs. I don't know how he put his hand, but he gets a shoulder dislocation. Uh, and if you look here, uh, there is a massive tear in the infraspinatus as well, and uh, not just a pure dislocation. And uh, you look at the MRI here. This is the axial view. This is uh, the one you can see there is uh, a tear on the supraspinatus as well. Uh, and this is his MRI. You can see how the extent of the tear goes through the infraspinatus. So, uh, we have to, when we need to manage this patient, we have to address all, all his problem. He has a traumatic tear. He presented to me uh, five weeks after his injury, so it's not acute injury. And uh, so uh, he was in pain, he couldn't sleep, and we uh, diagnosed him immediately, and we planned his surgery, uh, age and young and active. So when we went with the scope inside, uh, it's different than everything. It's it's a mistake capsule because like when you do, you go from the back, you look at the shoulder, you don't see that big room here at the back. This is definitely not what we see every day. It's a pitulous uh capsule due to the redundancy of the of the infraspinatus and the capsule and the tear. He also has uh, 
uh, anterior labral tear, but uh, for the sake of the presentation, we are not going to go through that for now. We we'll just focus on on the anterior laxity from the anterospinatus tear. This is from intra. We went to the scope from the front to see the capsule and how uh, how redundant is the capsule. So we went ahead with the, with the repair. Uh, here we identified the tear uh, through the rent here. So we tried to minimize the dissection. There's a lot of scar tissue and uh, from the previous, uh, sorry, from the injury itself. So we tried to be gentle here with the soft tissue. We went down uh, to the bone and we prepared two uh, anchors for the infraspinatus part. And we use uh, double row fixation again uh, for, for this. I usually like to put anchors that has both suture and tape because I can tie and I use the uh, tape to support the uh, uh, the repair. And uh, you always have to manage where you put your suture, not to mix it up. Uh, and you have to know where exactly you're putting your other suture. So suture management is an essential when you deal with uh, this repair. I usually don't use uh, 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 annulus for my arthroscopy. I think I I owe uh, Laurent for that. I visited him in 2006, and uh, uh, that changed what I do. Uh, and I stopped using canvas. So this is, we tie the knots anteriorly, uh, and we tie the second knot, the, the second anchor in the same fashion. Then we fix it laterally. Oh. He has a, a good bone quality, young guy, so we use something like a, a butch lock. I wasn't worried about his bone quality. He's only four years old. So the moment we fix the infraspinatus here, uh, you will see uh, in a minute the second anchor. Uh, you, the difficulty with infraspinatus, you work under your scope, under where you stop. So it is, it is not like when you do the anterior part, you look forward. Uh, this is always in your, uh, uh, your armpit, as they say. So you can see this is, we have a good repair. We tested the muscle, we push, and you see how uh, that uh, our uh, repair house it. Then we just went ahead and deprived, and the next step was to fix the anterior part of the of the cuff. You can see that the tear and the supraspinatus, and uh, it was very clear now once we repaired at the back, and we did the same uh, when uh, we did. A double row fixation as well. Uh, as you see, this is a young guy. Double row, we need to minimize any uh, risk of uh, re tear, uh, especially with this massive. So we put an anchor there and repair it there. We find there is a, a flap in the middle, so we add one more tape uh, to close that, uh, we use it to, to close the, this one, to close the middle. So this is the overall repair. And this is how the capsule inside look like afterward. And so this is, if you look at the capsule, this is initial, and you can see 
that's how it's redundant and use uh, butchers and book and then and this is bust up you can see it's all closed it's great the muscle is uh, dense We're trying to find the space to get to see properly it was difficult not like at the start and this is the gentleman at four months following his repair He still has a little bit limitation at the terminal uh, end, and this is his abduction. Internal rotation. And this is his uh, uh, external rotation, which is uh, four plus at this point. You need still to strengthen it, but it is uh, uh, it's very good for him. Uh, Laurent was talking about a large subscapularis tear, uh, which is uh, not the very common. The very common is the grade one or two. So I'm going to show you what I do for grade one and two. I can see here. Uh, this is freeing and uh, so we need to deprive it of course you have to deprive between uh, front and the back of the uh, subscapularis so otherwise you cannot free it you cannot mobilize it here i didn't need to free a lot because it's already still the length is intact but you have to bring this up you have to pull it up to you. So I deprived, uh, you can see here, it's almost peel off the lesser tuberosity. So usually shave it and repair it. My repair, I use the lasso here. I put uh, a double uh, figure of eight switcher, so we pass for this time. Um, Then, uh, we bust the first suture, then we bust the second one. When I bust the second one, I have to manage the suture to go over the proper tissue. Uh, you, you see, if you look at immediately here, that's a good tissue here of the subscapular. So I've tried to tease the suture loop to go over the good bulk of the top, otherwise it will not bring it forward for the repair. And then uh, I pass another one to give it a double uh, repair. And you usually fix it with the uh, with the knotless anchor. And this is the second anchor anteriorly. Uh, usually not worried about them. They usually uh, do very well. You can see the, uh, the tissue is good. So, uh, and uh, uh, I can see uh, the, the repair, they always uh, do very well. Uh, at the end, I want to show this picture, uh, me and uh, Laurent from 
uh, November 30th, uh, 2000, uh, this is 2nd of December, our national day in 2006 in NSC. Me and Dr. Ali Suwedi, uh, Dr. Hussein Al-Matri, Dr. Uh, Amr Mansour, and Dr. Ahmed Sayyad. And of course, uh, Professor Laurent Lafosse was the star of the show. Thank you. So my disclosure, I will start with something which is very important because, you know, Saeed show you many important things and tricks and I love this video, mostly uh, uh, the video of the release and we, we both spend a lot of time to release. And I think that, I don't know, we will discuss with Saeed, but I think that most of the surgeries, 80% of the time is released and 20% of the time is repaired. Yeah. And I think it's a very important to uh, not to rush to the repair, but to expose the solar and everything. And sometimes, this is even a, a very important uh, key point that I want to underline is that we, we neglected a lot of cough tear and a deep layer tear due to the fact that everybody is starting to do the solar arthroscopy from the back. Now, in every massive rotator cuff tear, I do my solar arthroscopy from lateral and I start from the subversal view. And if you do that, and then you will see what happened here is a double layer repair. So let's go to this double layer and the bird pick. Uh, we have here the anatomy uh, of a normal patient here, which is the bird pick patient. And this is uh, Usama. Again, we have many microphones working on. I don't know if you can do something. So it's important to know that uh, there is a differentiation between the deep layer and the superficial layer. And here the superficial layer uh, will be involved in more abduction after 60 degrees at the deep layer. And the tip progression is always from the deep to the superficial layer for a double layer tear. And sometimes the opposite, which means that the deep layer can be intact and you have a superficial layer tear, mostly when you have a big, AC joint arthritis and impeachment. So there's a kind of combination, but it's very important to, to understand that you really have a t-shirt and a jacket on the top of the t-shirt, which is the deep layer and the superficial layer, with uh, a very thick uh, deep layer and, and sometimes less thick superficial layer. So the question is how to do that? We can do the double repair to uh, repair both layers together or we can do it differently. And what I don't really like is to bring these two layers, avoiding to respect the anatomy. So what I want to do is to respect this deep layer fixation with the superficial uh, layer fixation differently. This is how I developed the lesser loop technique. And this is what I want to show you on a case. We don't do so many MRI, we do CT, but what you can see here is that it's a massive cuff tear. And, and that we, are, we will see the, the parapetic video. So this is a double layer cuff repair. And you see here, deep layer is there. This is not a capsule. This is the deep layer of the rotata cuff because you can't see that. And this is the superficial layer of the rotata cuff, which is a different layer. And that comes at a different level because the deep layer stops its insertion at the level of the cartilage, the superficial layer is inserted toward the lateral side of the great tuberosity. So as they have both a different insertion location, you should restore the anatomy by doing a different repair for both layers. So what I want to do is that I want to repair the deep layer first with this lasso loop technique here and you see that this deep layer has been repaired with the lasso. And you will see that I'm using the, the two uh, frets of uh, uh, the anchor differently. This anchor has two sutures and each suture has two frets of force. So I use one of the two frets to manage the lasso of both sutures, the blue and the white. Then I pull on the other one, like on a pulley. And I bring the deep layer back to its location here. What about a superficial layer? I use the same suture, same frame. But here I restore it at a different level because I restore the anatomy this way. And you see here that we restore 
with the deep level here, the superficial layer, by going through the superficial layer to capture the suture which has been used to manage the lesser loop of the deep layer. So now we have one thread of both sutures which has been passed on this manner. And now we will have the two other threads of the two sutures who are going through both layers now. So it's uh, this management of suture is maybe a little complicated to understand at the first shot, but it's not very difficult to understand. And the main advantage is best is that it will restore the anatomy, exact anatomy. And then you can use one, two, three anchors medially to restore the reattachment of the deep layer with the lasso and to go with a mattress through the superficial layer. And this is uh, what I'm doing here. And what you can see is that sometime in order to be faster, you can go through the loop, but this is more technical uh, thing, a trick to go faster, to catch the suture inside the loop and to manage on one stage instead of two, two stage. The, the the suture but what is important to understand is that when you will pull the knot the post will be the thread that goes to the anchor without the lasso means that you will pull on that post in order to bring the lasso to the anchor and to use the anchor as a pulley and you see that we restore really the anatomy. And it's not only to restore the coverage of the tuberosity, but it's something that will really restore the entire uh, anatomic insertion of the rotata cuff. And as it was uh, perfectly shown by Said before, and then we do the suture bridge, was the knotless anchor, whatever anchor you want to, pre to prefer to use. But what is important is that this bone is very soft. And this is why I want to tie the knot medially and not to keep all the uh, suture in my repair on a knotless anchor without paying any knot for the medial bone. So that's the repair. We have an experience. We uh, published this in 2012, uh, 18, sorry. So two years ago. And we have a significant improvement for 82 patients. And uh, we saw that there is a lower pain score in patients when they went separate double layer repair and a strong, very, very strong repair. So uh, now, if you allow me, I go to a massive cuff or we can stop here, Usama. It's according what you prefer in terms of timing. Uh, how long it might take? 10 minutes. Go ahead. Eight, eight. Okay. So a massive cuff there. That's the schematic, the size, the number, the repairability, repairability. I would say these two last steps are the most important. Size, sometimes you have a big tear, easy to repair. And you, you think that you are a very good surgeon. And, and the next patient is a small tear, you think you will be very fast and it takes long and hard to, to repair. So the size of the tear is not always a criteria which, is, which correlate directly with difficulty. So uh, what is for sure is that uh, repairability is uh, something when you can do that and then you need to find something else. But let's look at the repairability and the case presentation for a young guy, hairdresser. Here you see the x-ray, you see it's a large cuff tear. I will go fast to this. And it's a massive cuff tear repairable because of age arthritis, minimum super escape, good subscap, no fatty infiltration, which is a very important criteria for me. So let's go to this. This is the tear, and this is the size of the tear. See, it's not a small one. I start, as I told you, from lateral view. The biceps is involved. Supraspinatus is involved. Subscap is intact, but the biceps here is involved. So I think it's important to understand how to manage this. The first thing is to clean. 
and I, you do everywhere, you clean and you release the cuff. And that was a wonderful video from Said before to show you the uh, release. And this is the extraticular release. So let me show you the extraticular release here. So this is the extraticular release where you can see that it's bleeding. One of the, uh, one of the problems sometimes is that as you want to see well, you create a lot of swelling with the shaver because you want to see, so you increase the pressure and, and it's bleeding and then you have swelling. This is not good. You must pay attention not to over tight the shoulder, to be fast on that stage and not to increase too much the pressure of the shoulder and in order not to have too much swelling. I do love to open here the joint and the cockroach process in order to release very well anteriorly and to see if it's cockroach ligament, you know. It's the right shoulder, we come from lateral and here we can see that this cockroach ligament is really attached to the cockroach and we want to detach it. We want to do an intraarticular release and here it's exactly what has been shown by Said before. You do it anteriorly, you do it posteriorly, you do it superiorly. Suprascapular nerve release, which is a very interesting discussion, but I can tell you but what I know that I don't know when to do it or when not to do it. But what I do, every time I have a master rotator cuff, I go to the nerve, I look at if is it squeezed. If it's squeezed, I release it. If it's not squeezed, I let it go and I don't touch it. But I look at the suprascapular nerve, it takes for me 30 seconds to one minute to do the release. And it's not a very difficult thing. And sometimes it helps a lot for the post-operative pain to have less pain for the patient and to get a better uh, reconstruction. The video row, uh, this is a combination. And this is, that, that was one of the questions before. Uh, do you prefer with subscap to do a, a bicep stenotomy or bicep stenodesis? I do usually bicep stenotomy, but if I want to use the biceps to reinforce my rotator cuff repair, and then this is what I do. I do a bicep stenodesis that combine the biceps fixation to the anchor and the anterior footprint of the supraspinatus together on the same anchor and the same suture. So I do my single or my double lesser loop around the biceps, and then I pass this frayed around the tendon of the supraspinatus in order to have something that will combine both tendon together on the same anchor and the same suture that allows me to reinforce the anterior footprint of supraspinatus. And of course, I cut the biceps from the glenoid in order to have the biceps continuity together with supraspinatus, which is exactly the opposite to the uh, what is the very uh, well used today uh, uh, superior rotator cuff reconstruction with the superior capsule reconstruction. Yeah, I just detach it. And then we have the posterior one, and then I will do the same repair as what we saw before. So I will go fast on this, and I will do a double row repair with a double layer, so I will escape this one. One of the tricks I want to show you is this one. When you don't see very well, and this is uh, one of the other questions, do you prefer lateral decubitus or B chair? I use B chair with some traction and tailing, but the, the side effect of B chair is that sometimes you don't have a lot of room posteriorly. And in order to have room between the bicep, between the deltoid and the infraspinatus, I just insert the Foley catheter, the Foley catheter that urologists are using. And if you dissect the nerve, which is the axillary nerve laterally here, and then you can see that this is where you see the, ten the nerve and it's not dangerous for the nerve. So I will do my double row repair like I showed you before, which is fine. And then I will use the suture bridge as I used so before, which is okay. Acromioplasty, and I will do. And now, what about some people who has a non-repairable? This is a non-repairable. That will be my last video that will take two and a half minutes. This is a lady that I know, she's a, a surgeon and she has a, a terrible pain due to a, a problem and I repair her and I had to use a side-to-side a -side sewing machine. What is it? It's this. It's exactly what you use every day with a sewing machine. 
I started to do surgery when I was four years old. My sewing, I loved to sew when I was a child. And I'm still sewing and I don't forget. I haven't forgot what I was uh, learning when I was a child. The sewing machine is nice. It works like this. So let's look at this video. This is a massive tear. And it's like, uh, what I showed you before, it's a side to side bed without anchor. So this is the anterior layer, it's a V shape. And very often you have a V shape and you can even have a double layer here. But you see the quality of the tendon does not allow you to come back to the tuberosity and to make, it, to make it work. So what I did is that I took one suture, only one. It must be a good suture because if you take a bad uh, suture, it, it's not gonna work well. But here you see, you take both layers. This is the deep layer. And I will manage to make a lesser loop on the deep layer here. Is that okay, Usama, if we run this video uh, two minutes more? Yes, yes, you can. Okay, and then my lecture will be done. So this is the deep layer, and I do a, a lasso. As you can see, I use my two hands. My assistant, my fellow, is holding the video. Is my brain. My fellow is my brain. I'm only the two hands. But I have one hand on the left, one hand on the right, with a clever hook on the left and a clever hook on the right, or a suture grasper. So here, I have one of the suture and I used my clever hook from the left to prepare and to expose my rotator cuff in order to grab the suture with my clever hook on the right. And that's the start of my side to side suture. And then progressively, I will create a loop. The loop comes from the right, which is the front of the shoulder. And I will go with this loop toward the left and I will bring it toward the posterior layer on the left. And look, this loop, I will take the suture which is on the back and go through the loop with the suture on the back. And this is the running suture. You see one, two, three loops. One, two, three loops coming from the front and the running suture which is straight going through each loop on the back. And when you have these three loops here and the suture, and then you will pull on both sutures and progressively what is interesting is that the side to side will automatically be balanced as a permanent traction which is a balanced traction from medial to lateral avoiding to have an excessive traction lateral or different traction from the lateral one to the to the third one that's it and this is how to close the suture. So in conclusion, the repairability is not always linked to the size of the tear. The muscle statement is certainly the most important parameter. Release and analyze of the tear before repair is the most important step and very difficult to manage without swelling and excessive swelling. You must be very friend with your anesthesiologist in order to have good condition for repair. Thank you for your attention.